Hey, this is Evan Longoria of your San Francisco Giants, and you're listening to Torture Cast. You're listening to a podcast by and for fans of the San Francisco Giants. With hosts Willie Dills, Chad King, Ben Lee, and Eric Nathanson. Dedicated to the greatest team in Major League Baseball, the San Francisco Giants. This is Torture Cast. It's Monday, March 4th, 2019, and this is episode 158 of the Torture Cast, the podcast by and for fans of the San Francisco Giants. I'm your host, Chad King, and joining me today from Georgia is Eric Nathanson. What's up, dude? Not much. How are you doing out there, out, out in California land? Uh, the weather just kind of is... We've been having more rain than we've had in the last several years. I think our snowpack's at 160%. People are getting buried in the snow up there. It's like epic conditions, and we're just... I, you know, I'm coaching a little league team again this year, and um, we have opening day this Saturday. Which, by the way, the ceremonies were already canceled because there's forecast rain, uh, but we still have pictures and stuff. And then we have games starting the, the the next week. I have practice later today with them. It'll only be our fourth practice. We've had to cancel four already, so oh, we're operating awesome. at about a fifty percent clip right now. And I don't even have, you know, this is the first year not not for pitching. They pitched last year, but we had like coach assisted pitching when they walked guys now this is like all real baseball you know what i mean so we have pitch counts too that we have to adhere to uh and there's walks and steals and strikeouts and everything under the sun so uh, i don't have a full assessment of my pitching rotation <laughs> yet i've seen two kids pitch that's it so i got a lot of work left to go but uh, how about you out there in georgia it's, is it better well, you- yeah, you're in my world with sogginess because uh, we've been sog. We had tornadoes come through. Everybody saw yesterday horrible tornadoes, and and I was right in that zone, two counties over. There were tornado warnings, and one developed yeah. over a city, two t- two counties over. But that's how I talk now because I live in the country. You know, oh yes, it's yonder two counties. Um, <laughs> but Hop, like, skip we've had a real. Oh man, I I can do my I, I fit right in down here. Um, <laughs> It's just been a soggy, so- soggy mess. It's funny you're in my world. They have pitch limits. How, how much? What is? I mean, that totally intrigued me. And we're totally off topic right before we, we jump into stuff. But um, <laughs> when I was in Little League, we didn't have pitch limits until my yeah. dad wrote a letter and contacted Dr. Frank Job, the guy who originated the Tommy John surgeries. And he was working for the Dodgers, and my dad and him corresponded, and oh, he wow. asked about. Yeah, and he, he found out about the benefits of pitch limits and things like that. And at every age, you know, they'd add 10 pitches and, and, and whatnot and, and things like that. So, like, how, how old are they and how many pitches? That always reminds me of that when I hear pitch limits. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of trying to brag on my dad. I thought that was cool. but No, that's, that's cool. You know, because when I coached my daughter, there were no pitch limits. In softball, there just isn't that same torque on the arm. So they don't have pitch counts at all, period. So I could throw a girl for seven innings, six innings, and she could pitch the very next day. Um, I wouldn't do that, but she could, you know, by the rules. For the boys, it depends if you're 9 or 10 years old because this is the 9 and 10-year-old league. So 10-year-olds have a little bit more in terms of what they can pitch. But I know the ultimate limit, I believe, and I don't have all the numbers in front of me, is 65 pitches. Uh, But there's a couple of different benchmarks. Like there's 20 pitches, 35 pitches, and I think 45 pitches. And each time they hit that benchmark, like the first benchmark, now they can't pitch for two days. The second benchmark, three days. And the final benchmark, it's four or five days. So you have to play that kind of game of, okay, when's my next game? And if it's within five days, then you got to think about, if I want this guy to pitch the next game, he can't pitch not just 65, but maybe he can't pitch over 35, you know? So, uh, and the other thing is we all know Little League. These kids are not throwing at a 90% strike clip. I mean, the pros don't do that either. So if a kid gets into a bad groove and suddenly he walks two or three or three out of four, I mean, that's a lot of pitches. He's suddenly eating up 20, 25 pitches in a matter of four batters, you know? And then it's like, oh, crap. He might not even make it an inning or two before I got to switch. So I, I, I'd say the average number of pitchers that I've been told that need to be used in a standard minor league game is minimum three. 
because you just you can't you can't survive with just two pitchers because they most likely yes. will hit their pitch limits. So, you know, I got to identify at least three to five. Well, at least three, but hopefully four to five pitches on this team, and that's going to be <laughs> that's going to be a stretch. Wow. Yeah, back yeah. in the day, I remember we, we always had, you know, like two guys that would pitch on each team, and, and then, like, everybody else was an okay, you know what I mean? But that's, yeah. that's, I remember, I don't know for you, but growing up for me, that's always seemed to be how it was. I was just curious. When you mention pitch limits, my, my haunches go up. No, but, uh, it's it's good to protect I, the kids, but. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they're young. I They don't throw curveballs. and eh, You know what? I don't need to go down this road. No, nah, no, they don't. <laughs> I'm sure someone does. But yes, we are back. It's been it's been five weeks, and and we took a little long because we wanted to, you know, we wanted to be able to talk about spring training and and once that started, uh, and then we kind of held off an extra week just to kind of see if this Harper situation was going to develop, and and it did. It concluded last Thursday, and we got a lot to talk about. We'll we'll try to hit him as quickly as possible. But let's go ahead and start with Bryce Harper. Harper Watch 2019 really started in 2018 is over, and uh, it really was kind of uh, annoying at the end because every day you heard a different rumor and you got to the point where you're like I don't I don't even lend any credence to any of these rumors anymore because they kept switching every other day. You know, some guy heard, oh, the Giants are the, in the favorites. Oh, the Dodgers are back in it. Oh, the Phillies are back to being favorites. It just was like just freaking make a choice, right? And yeah, you know, we'll we'll talk about this in terms of the contract length, but the Phillies did ultimately land Bryce Harper. He is staying surprisingly to some in the NL East and away from his home in Vegas. And we all knew that those were some criteria that he was considering in terms of signing with a West Coast team. But ultimately, he signed for a 13-year contract, which just blew me away and most people, $330 million. And as it turns out, the Giants were right in it. They offered him 12 310 and the Dodgers had only offered him five to six with a very high a- annual average of forty to forty-five million per year, yes. which dwarfs wow. the Phillies twenty-five. Uh, and the Giants were their annual average was just slightly above the Phillies by about three hundred K per year. But some of the main motivating factors that have been reported now, and you can help fill this in, Eric, is uh, one was length of the contract. He wanted to be he wanted to play for one more team. That's it. He didn't. He wanted to be a free agent one time. So that extra year had a eh, little something to do with it. Uh, uh, two was uh, the fact that um, he had the high annual average, which is great. Three was ballpark for sure. And then this isn't any particular order, by the way. Uh, three is ballpark. And we all know the problems that the Giants have in luring in big-time power hitters, especially left-handers. Uh, ever since Bonds left, he, he was pretty much impermeable to uh to that the dimensions of the park but you know someone like bryce harper look in that band box and i I, i'm gonna ask you this right now i would everything being equal if he was playing with the giants or with the phillies i would say a conservative estimate he would hit five home runs more per year on average what do you think yeah that was the number i had in my head immediately when you started down that road he's definitely going to be getting at least five more home runs in philly than in san francisco because there's times he's going to hit the ball to right center field where it would die in triples alley you know at oracle and it's still going to fly out of the yard at citizens bank i i I understand uh i like you i was kind of sick of it at the end and i it's funny because uh Two different times, uh, I had a source contact me and tell me that Harper signing was en- imminent, and I, yeah. did not, <laughs> I did not run with it, and I refused to run with it. Uh, I didn't have a second source to back it up, and I just didn't believe anything until I saw the ink on the paper. And it was funny, though, because both times my source contacted me, then the stuff about the Giants meeting with, with him came out. So the timing synced up perfectly, except, you know, all they really knew was, hey, the Giants are meeting with him and offering him money. I, I'm not surprised that Harper chose somewhere like Philly because they are in a win now mode. And he really thinks he can go down as an icon there. Yeah. And I, I think he doesn't. He didn't see that same potential in San Francisco or even in Los Angeles. I mean, it takes a lot to go down in the pantheon of Dodgers and Giants in the history. With the Phillies, you've got what? Mike Schmidt, Robin Roberts, I mean, Ryan Howard maybe, uh, Jimmy yeah. Rollins. That's like, that's it. That's that's the best I can really, Steve Carlton. That's all I can name off the top of my head. But when you go out to like the Giants, McCovey, Mays, Bonds, you know, you go down to L.A., it's everybody. Koufax, Drysdale, mm-hmm. uh, 
you know, Kirk Gibson, all that stuff. So I, I think that that's personally, I think that's why he chose Philly. He thinks he can become an icon there. Uh, the park is more suited to him, but you know, I'm not upset as a Giants fan that mm-hmm. they didn't land him. I am concerned though that once again, the California state income tax, right? Is and that that was going to be another uh, item in there because that was cited as a, as a reason. And, he, and and look up the difference, okay? So California state's income tax for him would have floated around 13%. In Pennsylvania, it's three. That's a 10% swing on a $330 million contract. So you're talking 30 to 30 million, $33 million are left off the table in, uh, you know, for the Giants. And so the Giants would have had to to match, essentially, Philly's offer. Would have had to have gone up to 360 Okay, uh, give it again uh, for a 13 year contract or maybe 345 or something like that, 340 for a 12 year contract, not 310 that they offered. So, yeah, I mean, he's going to make more money in Philly because of those taxes. It's, it's just incredible to me. He wanted to be close to his family in Vegas, but, you know, he said uh, personally that uh, the owner and his, and his family and, and everything came out and talked to him, and he was just really impressed by their commitment to excellence. And, and the reality is the Phillies are in a much better shape right now than the Giants. Of course, in the future, who knows what, what's going to change. And in two years, you know, Mike Trout's going to be a free agent. Um, uh, so they're talking about that possibility. Uh, uh, and they have the, the financial flexibility to do it because the annual average is only 25 point something for the Phillies. For this year, it's a, it's like uh, 10, what is it's it, 10, $10 million? It's yeah. 10 for this year. He gets and then a 20, 20 million sign, signing bonus. Yeah. yeah, separated into two payments. And then it averages 22 for like the first seven or eight years and then it bumps up to 26 for the back end of the deal and to be honest when you see guys signing for 30 35 and 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 everyone expected him to get 30 minimum it is kind of a deal for philly it really is now huge deal but you know that said regardless of the money you know if if they got a five million dollar discount or whatever because he wants to stay there again here we are in baseball i mean eric can you name me in all of baseball the last you know, 10, 20 years, any of these seven to now 13-year mega, mega, mega contracts that have ever worked out in the favor of the team? No, this is the first instance where I think everybody's taken the long view of the contract and been like, hey, wait a second. This team didn't kill themselves by signing this long-term deal. Because mm-hmm. usually teams will hamstring their payroll because you pay a guy for maybe seven years, but he's only productive for the first three. And yeah. then his decline kicks in and his his average value, you know, if you take, you know, uh, they use algorithms now. So they try to equate essentially what war is c- compared to how much that's worth per contract. And right. by the end of the deal, the, the guy's fading into oblivion. But a deal like this with Harper, you're talking about twenty eight million dollars 12 years from now. That's gonna still. That could make him the fourth highest paid player on the team at that point. <laughs> That's know, a thing, there, yeah. There could, right. There could be two or three stars that ha- aren't even in the league yet because we're talking about so far away from now that could be getting huge mega deals that you know are averaging thirty five million, thirty million a year. You know, you mentioned Trout. This absolutely left Philly room to go get Trout. And Trout's a South Jersey guy. He's Philly through and through. That's his city. Yep. And from from living in that area for a long time, I mean, it's right over the bridge. That there's like no distinction between Philly and South Jersey. It's it's a Philly suburb, full on Philadelphia, you know, rooting interests. And I, I could see them trying for him. Overall, yeah, there's. No- I, sorry, I had to turn mute and cough. No, that's fine. Uh, Go ahead. But but like you said, we've never seen a deal like this that's so team friendly when we look at the scope of it. You know, looking at Barry Zito's deal, we hated it. You know, oh my God. For, yeah, from day do? one. <laughs> right. Oh my God. We paid $22 million a year, whatever, $21 million, 18, whatever it was. You know, now we're, we're, they're in the 30s, you know, and he is a bargain. Bryce Harper came at a bargain. And you know what? He, I thought he was going to go for the most money, and he chose, like you said, stability. He only wanted to play for one more team. It surprised yeah. me, and, you know, more power to him. The Phillies are going to be a good team. You know, they seem to have a core like when they came up in 07 and 08 and won the World Series before the Giants knocked them off their pedestal. So, you know, hopefully we can have the same turn of events here. Maybe Phil will be good for a couple of years and then the Giants can come in and dethrone him again. Yeah, I know they have like 50 something million under the luxury 
cap too. So, I mean, they have plenty of fle- flexibility. They've got a pretty solid lineup. they got Jack Arrieta, a decent pitching staff. Their Pocota projection, by the way, with Bryce Harper's adjusted war, went from 85 wins to 89. So, I mean, it, it's a significant you know boost to their... I, mean, I think the Giants are at 74 or 75. So, if they'd gotten you know, Harper, maybe they would have you know been projected to win 79 or something like that. But... Point being, the Giants aren't going to be good probably for at least a couple of years, and and that was another you know factor I believe in his decision because there's no reason to to say there's no way the Phillies can win a World Championship this year. They're they're in a position on paper, you know, to be in the playoffs this year. So and then going into the future, who knows? Yeah, good. And Andrew right. McCutcheon is their leadoff man. That still blows <laughs> my mind. And they got JT Real Muto too. I mean, he he's been an incredible catch for the last couple of years too. Uh, but they're done. That's okay. Um, I'm not upset about it. I, I definitely did not want the Giants to sign another Albatross Albatross contract because again, these are all guaranteed. And uh, you know, Harper blows out a disc in his back or suffers a major knee injury or just something happens in five years at age 30 or 31, and that's it. That's all she wrote. And it's just you're stuck with that contract until 2032, man. I mean, so I I kind of wrote down some stuff. I thought that was kind of fun of. What we could see over the course and the duration of Bryce Harper's 13-year contract. Well, we could see up to four different presidents, including, of course, the current president. Uh, My kids will be ages 26 and 22. Holy crap. Uh, Yeah. I will be 58 and like on AARP benefits or something. You'll be four years away from collecting Social Security. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) You said you'd be 52. His contract will hit puberty. You said uh, he'll have a bar mitzvah. He'll have a bar mitzvah. Like <laughs> and then just for reflection's sake, for some of you that are kind of closer to our ages, um, here's some things that happened 13 years ago in the year 2006. Well, first of all, of course, Bush was president. Obama had a full eight years in between that. Uh, Crocodile Hunter, actually, that was the year that he was killed by the stingray. I remember that pretty indelibly. Uh, Corey Lytle for a baseball kind of angle here uh died in a plane crash remember when it hit that apartment building he was flying with an instructor uh he was a you know decent pitcher for the new york yankees uh and that was the year saddam hussein was found guilty and um sentenced to death so i mean it it seems so long ago eric but that's how long it's gonna be until his contract is up uh, the Corey Lytle one really jumped out. I was like, wow, that was 13 years ago? Because I remember I it was like an apartment building or a high-rise or something that he crashed into as he was flying. Yeah. My favorite, and we'll move on from Harper now because he is in the Giants' rear view at this point. Yes. Uh, my, 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 my favorite stat to come out of this is the Mets will be paying Bobby Bonilla uh, for three more you. years after the Bryce Harper contract ends. Love it. I love it. <clears throat> His million a year man just c- still collecting it. It's just oh, fantastic. Man. What a great retirement. Um, okay, so yeah, we you know I, I've seen both reactions from Giants fans. I'll, you know, for me, it's been about split down the middle. Some were pretty upset, going, "Well, that's it. Who the hell are we going to have in the outfield now?" Let's like you said, let's get the hot dog vendor out there, right? Uh, yeah. But a lot of them are looking at it from the pragmatic point of view and the financial point of view going, you know what? It's just in this day and age uh, with ownership pushing back on these long-term contracts. Yes. You have your couple of special ones like Machado who signed with the Padres, by the way, we glossed over that and Harper signing with the Phillies. Um, you know, the, the long-term contracts are bad value for the team. They, they almost always are almost a hundred percent of the time. And so they are pushing back and, and you see now this, uh, um, environment of one to three year deals and that's kind of where we're moving and it's better for the teams of course to assess that because it's like look we think you'll be this good for the next one to three years but beyond that who knows what's going to happen and we don't want to commit that much money to you because that hamstrings us for the next you know five years after that so that's what we're seeing now we're seeing this merry-go-round um the revolving door of players going in and out uh, but unfortunately one of the side effects of course is uh, uh, the collusion uh, finger pointing right now from a lot of the players union because we still have a lot of decent players uh, that have are still unsigned to this day, uh, which is pretty insane. So, you know, I, I think a lot of Giants fans are also going like, look, we, man, 12 years, 310 million. Screw that. I'm glad we didn't get them. Yeah, I, uh, I, I like you. I've seen kind of the mixed bag. My, my personal take 
you can't mourn something that you never had. Yeah. So, you know, they, they never had him. My the, my biggest takeaway from the Harper Saga ending is, okay, good. Now we can focus on what the Giants <laughs> do have. And he's also not with the Dodgers. I was really yes. getting worried about that oh, when he God, yes. when they re-entered because that is super, you know, subtraction by addition. Again, like anytime a West rival adds someone that you are competing for, you not only lose out on that, but then your opponent gains on it. And it's like a double whammy. And it's just, it's it really hurts. I mean, the Padres getting Machado is a, is a big deal. The Padres have a very good farm system. And, you know, the Padres, I think, are going to be pretty decent. Um, maybe not this year, but in you know the next few years, I think they have a good shot at, at, at being good in the West. So, you know, the Giants really are behind the eight ball when you look at a lot of the teams in the West. And, and Harper would have helped them, but at the same time, you know, they need a lot more than Harper. And so that's why right. it's not like he was going to take them to the promised land. Maybe in five years or four years when they kind of rebuild, but not not right now. Well, the Giants have a million players in camp. And yeah. the whole thought process, and, you know, and that's why it's nice to be able to turn and finally watch them. The whole thought process that seems to be going on right now, and I alluded to this later, is that Zayidi likes to build depth. He's really just trying to take whatever he can, throw it against the wall, and see what, see what sticks. That uh, stretch of signing Cameron Mabin, Yanjervis Salarte, and Gerardo Parra. And I, I, Gerardo Parra, I love Gerardo Parra. For years, every time he faces us, I absolutely hate, hate it because the guy's got yeah. a cannon for an arm. He always seems to be in the middle of everything. And my favorite part about him is you can almost say his name just by moving your jaw, by going, Gerardo Parra. You know, it's, <laughs> it's kind of a... Nice little bonus because it's like his name is a mumble when you go through it. But those are all $1.5 million contracts that are minor league deals. And it seems like they're just trying to build depth. The waiver wire is being worked every day. And now now we can kind of see, okay, the Giants are behind the eight ball, but what do they need to do to catch up? And I know there's Giants fans who are frustrated. I had somebody t- uh, tweet at me that um, the Giants need a superstar and they need to pay a superstar now. And it's like, no. Why? Yeah. They're, they're not going to compete for a title this year. The Giants are not one move away. They're a series of moves away. There's a series. reason there's a ton of guys in the bullpen. They're going to trade some of those guys. There's a reason why they're building depth as much as they can in the farm system. So they can stash guys there to cycle them in and out and use the options up and, and use every bit of uh, advantage that the uh, operation side has. And, and they're going to continue to do that. So now we get a chance to finally look, okay, you know, is Mabin and Para, are they going to, you know, do something in the outfield? Maybe this Drew Ferguson kid will uh, be in a platoon with Duggar. You know, now we can finally see that Evan Longoria claims that he's, you know, better than ever this season. We can finally look ahead to a giant season. I, I, I felt like uh, Thursday when the news finally came out, like a weight was lifted, like, okay, all right, this Harper crab's done. Now yeah. we can see what the Giants have. Now we can focus on the season. And, and 2019 like started right then for me. No, I, I completely agree with you. It's now, it's just kind of like, you know, it, <laughs> you're playing the lottery. Maybe not to that extreme, but, you know, maybe a local bingo or something. And you're like, oh, I, I'm one letter away from winning this. And you're just sitting on the edge of your seat. But then when it's over, you're like, okay, cool. I'm just going to go get some drinks now. You know, that's what it kind of feels like. It's like, well, we missed out, but it's not the end of the world. It's no big deal. We'll, we'll we'll be fine with it. Um, so <laughs> my dog's going a little crazy right now. Hopefully she won't start barking. Um, so now what? Uh, they got a lot of depth, like you just alluded to, and I, I've seen again a lot of casual fans on Twitter and social media, which of course those uh, voices are, you know, um, uh, amplified when you're looking at social media. It's not like a the pulse of the entire Giants community. But a lot of them are very upset at Zaidi, not just because of the Harper thing, but like, who the hell are these guys? Who's this Para guy? Why are these minor league contracts? Oh, God, the Giants are going to suck this year. This new GM sucks. And again, there's not that much out there. And I will give him credit because he is signing and signing and signing. He's doing things that Bobby Evans never did before. Bobby Evans just stood pat. A couple signings in the offseason. He is out there wheeling and dealing, and he's flooding that spring training camp with names we've have seen in the past, you know, journeyman outfielders and, and some relievers, but also some up-and-comers, too, most of them to minor league contracts. I think it's fantastic because, you know, the Giants can take a look at all these guys. In fact, I was looking at their pitching stats. You know, they only have had, what, nine games so far? I believe they're 4-4-1 four, four, and one or something like that. 
They've had 36 pitchers throw in a game already. That's crazy. I mean, that's like such a wow. huge volume, right? Uh, not to mention the number of at-bats, too. So uh, they're giving a lot of people looks, a lot of people opportunities. Most of these guys are obviously not going to be on the roster. It's physically impossible. They can only carry 25. Uh, but it, it, it's at least he's showing the due diligence in bringing in some veterans and some people with experience and some young arms, too, uh, to try and give it you know, the management, the best shot they have in choosing the best team going forward. And so that provides a lot of operational depth. They have a lot of these guys that can play all over the outfield and even in the infield. So um, you got to give him at least a little bit of credit. And he put in a pretty damn good offer for Bryce Harper. It's not like it was a piddly, like, fake offer. I mean, they really went for it. So um, he, he's, I think so far, he, you know, I, I give him a B plus so far. Well, he, I read through Baggerly did a kind of a behind the scenes of the Giants and the Harper. And Zaidi was right there at the front going for him. So it wasn't like Zaidi's like this new math guy coming in and being like, no, we can't spend this money here. But on the flip side, you are seeing that because he is not going to. Uh, Adam Jones is not coming to the Giants because no. he's not going to give Adam Jones what Adam Jones thinks he's worth at this point. And we talked about, you know, you mentioned the collusion. And what what's going on is all the teams now have this algorithm. And mm -hmm. the algorithm spits out how much a certain player is worth based on, you know, this, that, this, that combined. Like I said, it's almost an amalgamation of war. And so if somebody doesn't fit that prototype, Players aren't getting signed, and that is the biggest, uh, to me, red flag of collusion because they may not be doing it on purpose, but they're doing it. And uh, mm -hmm. I, I mm -hmm. think he has shown us he's not, not going to go spend money on a guy like Adam Jones or even a guy like Marlon Gonzalez ended up with the Twins. That kind of surprised me. I, I, I didn't think they'd go for somebody like that. But like Denard Spann's not going to be signed to a deal unless it's very similar to the $1.5 million deal that Salarte, Mabin, and Para signed. Like, to me, those are the poster boys for what Zaidi is going to be trying to do. I agree, yeah. Yeah, I mean, Adam Jones would be a, a great addition to the Giants, but not at the contract in which he thinks he's valued at, like you just said. Right. He's 33 years old, and I'm sure... I mean, believe me, everybody who, who says, why aren't they signing Jones? What the heck is going on? They know way more than you do about every one of these players and players you've never heard of. So, yes, they, they run their numbers. They have their algorithm with future projections of war and on base percentage and all these other little things and the value, you know, for what that is forecasted to be. And I'm sure that they've either heard what Jones wants and he's so far out of the ballpark they don't even make contact or they've had a, a, a flyer call with his agent saying, hey, you know, we think he'd be good for a two million minor league deal or, or three million a year for a major league roster spot or something like that. And. I'm sure they just laugh at it. They go, no, no, he's he's worth $10 million a year, you know, guaranteed for five years right. or something like that, you know? And so I do believe that most of the teams are so far apart from guys like Adam Jones and others. But Marwin Gonzalez was actually a guy I, I did want the Giants to go for. But uh, what did he end up uh, – I know he signed with the Twins, but what was the average annual value? Do you remember on that one? Uh, it was two no, years? I, I I have no idea, but with you, okay. I, I kind of wanted him because of versatility. Versatility, we saw, yeah. We, yeah, I mean, let, let's be honest. Okay, we have to give the Dodgers a little bit of credit here. With the way their teams have gotten to the World Series the last couple of years and how they've operated under Zaidi, the fact, flexibility and depth have been their two strongest points. And there's no denying that. And in a sense, the Giants are trying to mimic that at this point. And so a guy like Marlon Gonzalez fits perfectly. But, you know, like you said, he got away. And, you know, seeing all the rest that's out there, now we know that, <clears throat> excuse me, now we know that this is pretty much the guys that are in camp. Besides from a trade that might be made sometime during spring training or right around cut time at the end of spring, these are the guys that are fighting for the jobs for the Giants. So I, I was curious, which job competitions in camp are you, like, keeping your most eye on? Is it whether or not, you know, Suarez or Rodriguez can stay in the rotation? Because now with Pomerantz in there, you know, that, that lengthens that out a little bit. Whether or not, you know, it depends who's going to be in the outfield. Is it going to be Slater? Is it going to be Mack? Is it going to be Para? Is it going to be – not going to be Maven. I just don't think so. No. Uh, yeah, well. Right. And then, you know, there's also the backup infield. Uh, Alan Han – Kelby's gone. Uh, but, you know, is it yeah, going to be Alan Hansen and mm – -hmm. 
Right. So is it Hanson and Solarte that'll be the backup infielders? Because Solarte can play the corners. You know, where's Pablo fit into this? So, so what? So what are you most looking at now that we're starting to get into spring training a little bit? What are the biggest, I guess, storylines and, and position battles you're keeping an eye on? Yeah, I mean, infield, infield is set, right? So we got we got Belt, Panic, you know, uh, Crawford, Longo, Posey, you know, around the five spots. Obviously, they're, they're going to have days off, and of course. Probably all those guys are going to get injured at some point this year, so you need your you need your operational depth. But as far as starting positions, the the entire infield is set. It really is just the outfield, and of course, you know the bullpen and and a little bit of the starting pitching. I think there's some wiggle room there too. Uh, but outfield is number one in my eyes right now, just because now that the Harper saga is over, um, they got you know freaking six, seven, eight guys that they could potentially fill roster spots uh, for the starting and or backup outfield positions and. I don't know, man. It's it, there doesn't seem to be any clear cut, you know, winners right now. I know Mac is probably going to get his shot now that Harper is definitely not signing. Um, you know, he he unfortunately his season was cut short by a concussion last year, and he's been interviewed about that, saying that, you know, he he was having real issues with that. Same with Brandon Belt with his previous concussions, um, but he's kind of been cleared. He's not getting dizzy spells anymore, and he can see the ball. So, and sure enough, he's already crushed two home runs uh, this spring. Uh, Chris Shaw, same thing. He's hit sent two over the wall as well, I think, you know. We'll, we'll see. He just seems to have too many holes in his swing right now. Uh, and you brought up the other guys. Maben, I don't think, uh, is probably going to make it. Um, he is a veteran, but I think uh, he's kind of proven that already in spring. Um, I mean, yeah. over 16 to start. Yeah, really he's over 16. That. It's hard I'm to overcome shot. that kind of a bad start. I know, I know. Uh, he's I'm got shot. He's got enough time, but... Today. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh my God. I was like, really? 16 at bats? Not a single hit? Oh, yeah, not man. a single hit. And he, he's back with Alonzo Powell. He's, he worked well with him with the Padres, who won a World Series with Alonzo Powell in Houston. So mm-hmm. he thought his swing would be back to good, and apparently it's not. <laughs> and Solarte and Para, you know, they, um, they're upgraded versions, I would say, of, of a Gregor Blanco, but. Um, you know, I, I don't know. It's it's really going to be interesting. Bochi definitely has his hands full uh, in regards to the outfield. But <clears throat> regardless of who is standing in the three positions in San Diego on March 28, no one's going to look at that and go, wow, that's a powerful lineup. <laughs> look at that outfield. <laughs> I mean, let's be honest, Eric. That's just not happening. It, it's kind of like, ah, yeah, those guys. All right. <laughs> Hopefully they get a couple hits today. <laughs> I need to go look it up, um, but chances are we're going to have our, I don't know, what is this, like 50, how long ago did Barry retire? 2007 so, was his last season, yeah. Okay, every year since then they've had a different starting left fielder, and I'm pretty yeah. sure that trend will continue this year. P- pretty sure. Every single opening day it's been a different starting left fielder. Last year it was Hunter Pence, so it absolutely is a different player this year. Yeah. It's just, just the most unbelievable it. stat that the Giants just cannot <laughs> fill the hole there. Uh, you know, you mentioned all, you know, and I, I mentioned earlier the battles. I'm keeping an eye on whether or not uh, they decide to platoon Duggar, whether or not they just want to face him against uh, righties. Plus, Bochy said that he's giving Duggar a shot at the leadoff spot during this spring training. So I'm curious to see if he can take that and run with it. Uh, and and his, his initial impressions have been very good, by the way. His speed is really keeping a lot of guys off off kilter. Everyone's l- liking the way, the energy he's bringing right now. So, yeah, I mean, I think he's probably the only, it, it's way too early to say, but in my mind, probably the only pseudo lock on one of the outfield positions in terms of center field. But other than that, yeah. And, you know, I'm just, just to harken back to last season, Duggar came up as a guy who we wanted to see get playing time and didn't mm-hmm. even make the club out of spring training. And here he is a year later as the only lock that they have. That shows you, like you said, how far behind the eight ball the Giants are, which is why this is going to take some time. You know, not to steal a line from Philly sports, but we got to trust the process. Trust the process. Yep. If any I guess I'll, st- I'll steal the line from Marcus Lemonis then instead. <laughs> if you've ever watched The Prophet, that guy's amazing. Trust the process because the process is important. Oh, you man. Know, I'm, I'm So I, I'm looking at that. I think, you know, I want to see Duggar get his fair shake. And I am curious to see who runs with the outfield job. You know, Mac really does seem like he's getting an opportunity. Uh, uh, and I, if he if he produces, he'll he'll take it. Bochi likes guys that he knows, and and he knows Mac at this point. You know, and then 
you know, starting pitching, I'm curious to see if D-Rod or Suarez starts the season in the minors. It really sounds like Zaidi wants to keep those options open and not have to force one of the young guys back in the rotation. Yeah, uh, I heard about that early, and um, just it caught me off guard a little bit uh, to to think that Derek Rodriguez, at least Zaidi's thinking about the option, uh, literally the option he has on his contract still, uh, that he could start him in the minor leagues, and... um, you know, it's not out of disrespect to him. It's it's more about protecting his arm and filling it in with a veteran. But uh, I, I was a little taken aback by that. I honestly thought, given how well he was last year, how how well he performed, that he just he was going to be a starter in April. But perhaps not. Yeah. So I mean that that's I mean those are the biggest stories for Giants camp. Uh, when you're yeah. a team that just doesn't know who you are, it's kind of tough to pinpoint. Well, you know, you can tell reading the beat writer, they're not sure what direction. Yeah, Every, it's, it's a it's a mystery. It's funny we we mentioned uh, you know uh, Adam Jones and and Denard Span are still unsigned. Cargo, uh, Jose Batista, but I mean, come on, who's going to sign him? That he's so washed up now. He proved it last year, being on like ten teams in a season. Um, but what's interesting is when we're talking about someone like uh, Suarez or or Rodriguez potentially starting the year in the minors uh, to protect them and to maybe have some more veteran presence in the starting. Uh, rotation for the first month or two of the season, it does kind of highlight, well, is there something they could work out with a Dallas Keuchel or Gio Gonzalez or Clay Buchholz? Because they're still out there as well. Um, you know, again, I think it's in the same situation where where those people are, are thinking they're way more valuable than teams think. So there's that bridge that they're trying to 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 kind of connect. But the Giants don't have a lot of payroll flexibility either. So uh, it would it would have to be a pretty good situation in which both parties would agree in terms of the Giants because other teams you would think have way more payroll flexibility and why aren't they signing a Dallas Keuchel or others you know right. um, so that's why I don't think the Giants because people are why aren't the Giants going after Dallas Keuchel they could really bolster their starting rotation it's like well yeah they could but then that puts them in the luxury threshold and, and why aren't other teams well, doing it who have the payroll flexibility like there's a, there's a lot of minutia here well, when you look at the Giants' starting rotation, we've got Baumgartner penciled in. Uh, Drew Pomerantz, it looks like, is penciled in. Yeah. Uh, Derek Holland. Uh, there you go. I just covered the three lefties. Because uh, yep. Holland, it seems like they're going to keep as a starter. And then Smarsh is coming back from injury. And I just saw go across my timeline. Today, Smarsh did three shutout innings, one hit, four Ks, two walks. And he is getting over every hurdle so far positively. Yes. Uh, Smarsh talked about at the beginning of camp, he talked about it back, uh, I think on media day actually or something, about how there were eight hurdles for him to get over during this spring training. First were the couple of sessions and then, you know, five starts throughout the spring training season. And this, I believe, clears hurdle number five. Mm-hmm. Uh, and again, he's positive and he's, he, I, hopefully he'll be feeling good. So Smarsha can regain some of what he's got. That does leave just that one open for Suarez or Rodriguez or, like you said, even a Geo or a Keiko. You can never have too much pitching depth. I'll never complain about pitching depth. I mean, that's how the Giants won the World Series in 2010. Yeah, they had all these veteran, you know, hitters. But if they didn't have Timmy and Bumgarner and Kane out there doing their thing, they never would have won the World Series. And yes. so I will never complain about pitching depth. If they want to take on more, I'm totally fine with that. I don't think it'll change the immediate needs, but it'll make me feel good that they – they. I mean, pitching depth. Sorry, it's just – Pitching and defense still wins championships, even in this offensive age, because you still need to make the plays that need to be made. Mm-hmm. But of course, you know we'll, we'll we'll see what happens. But it looks like the Giants are just moving forward with what they have now. Should something change, I think that's what they're stuck with. So um, let's go ahead and get into some early notable spring stats. Again, very early. Uh, Giants are four four and one. They're actually playing the Dodgers right now. The Dodgers just went ahead two to one in the fifth inning. But again, who cares? Uh, coming into today's game, uh, Giants were 12th in the majors in pitching, 4th in batting average, 2nd in home runs with 16, which is kind of surprising. Uh, individually, Zach Green and Chris Shaw each have two home runs to lead the team. Joey Bart, 4 for 8 with a home run. Uh, Longoria and Panic each coming in were 5 for 9 with a home run, although Longo already hit a solo blast today for his second home run of the season, or of the spring. Uh, Solarte, the aforementioned uh, outfielder, 5 for 12 with a home run. And then you got you guys that maybe aren't showing up right now. Cameron Mabin, 0 for 16, as we talked about, and Crawford, 1 for 12. But 
Uh, there's a there's a few more people we could talk about. And Bum, of course, you know, he got kind of shelled that first game. But to give him, you know, let's look at his past springs. He o- almost always gets shelled in the spring. He's working on different things. A lot of veterans do because they know that their job is safe. And so they're tinkering, they're doing whatever. But also he hit a guy in the head. And like right after he did that, he kind of melted down a little bit. So he said he was a little concerned about the guy. So uh, maybe psychologically, you know, he was a little shaken up by that. But he's given up seven earned runs in four innings. But again, this always happens every spring. No one ever worries about yeah. him. He reached out to David Bodie too, and they exchanged texts. And you know, so yeah, it was you know a nothing burger. I had no idea it even happened until the next day, and my wife loves David Bodie because he was really big for the Cubs last year. <laughs> and That's so right, I was like, yeah. hey, did you happen to know that yesterday Madison Baumgartner hit your David Bodie in the head? It was like, what? Oh, no. It was like, <laughs> no, no, everybody's good. Everybody's good. Everybody's yeah, good. everybody's good. Uh, the, the other thing, there was a, a, a game last week where Joey Bart homered. No, Chris Shaw. I think it was Shaw, then Bart, and then Zach Green. They hit back-to-back yeah. back home. At to back home runs and like the Giants don't do things like that it was neat to see and from what I've seen from Bart so far his swing is free and easy he's just got so much power packed into it and he threw a guy out trying to steal the other day too so Bart's not just a one dimensional player he's very athletic and I think it's good that the Giants are getting to see the future in camp I think so far he's been impressive more so yeah. than I think anybody expected he seems to carry himself uh, his first bullpen of the spring was with Bum. And I think that that just kind of broke the ice. And, you know, from from what I've been reading, it seems like he's just fitting in as one of the guys. And they're all just happy to see him, you know, progressing a little bit. I, I'm excited about Bart in the future. And seeing that Longo and Panic are hitting the ball is good, too, because Panic is in danger of a platoon if he doesn't get his crap together. And I don't want to see the Giants platoon him. I like Panic as a left-handed hitter in the top of the lineup if he can keep things going. So, mm-hmm. like you said, there's some stats that stick out, but it's spring stats, so you kind of take everything, you know, yeah. a little half-heartedly. You know, I, like I was shocked they were four, four, and one. I had no idea what the Giants' record is. I won't know what it is today. I won't know what it is three weeks from now. I, I yeah, don't care. it just it literally doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. I know some of these people posting on social media. Giants won today, and it's like, yep. Yeah, so. <laughs> right. All right, whatever. Uh, just a shout-out to uh, – I know, exactly. they also tied and didn't finish that game. A shout-out to Hunter Pence, of course, signed a minor league deal with the Texas Rangers. He actually played against the Giants in Scottsdale over the weekend, so he was given a massive, huge, warm ovation by Giants fans, which was really cool, and he called that out on social media. So uh, good to see him at least have a shot. Um, we'll, we'll see. You know, uh, Pulling for him to make the roster, but you know, there's no guarantees uh, he's Absolutely. getting to that Let's spot. See. Lexi retweeted me uh, yesterday. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, John Shea retweeted the video of Giants fans giving Hunter a warm ovation, and he said Giants fans like Hunter Pence. <laughs> and I quote tweeted it with, I think you mean we'd love Hunter Pence. You there know, you go. Love in all caps. And Lexi was going through stuff. She must have been yesterday morning or two days or you know Saturday night or something like that because it was Saturday afternoon, and she ended up retweeting it. Like I'm still you know getting stuff trickling in. Hunter favorited the tweet, so you know it was nice because we are a podcast by and for fans. So yes. those fan moments absolutely happen. And so it was cool. Like I went to my, my wife likes Lexi. So I'm like, hey, guess who just retweeted me? You know, it was, it was <laughs> That's fun cool. stuff. Yeah, it was, because we do. We love Hunter Pence. I, I hope he catches on with the Rangers. Yeah, me too. Maybe he's got another year or two left in him. So we got a couple more things to talk about. One, uh, which is temporarily earlier it happened, but uh, we kind of glossed over it. But Bruce Bochy announced his retirement, and there was a lot of noise coming into the season because this was the last year on his contract. And given the fact that the Giants have been – Uh, very poor the last two and a half years and not forecast to do well this year, you know, people were starting to wonder, um, could he potentially be either let go during the season or at the very minimum, let him finish out the season and just not offer him a contract because they need a change in managers if you have three and a half bad seasons in a row. Uh, But that was all put to rest because he announced his retirement. Um, He said he had been talking to management uh, over the winter, and he said he had he had a really good idea that he was going to do it, and he decided to announce it now because it was just going to alleviate the media and and uh, fans and everyone else asking him questions throughout the year over and over and over again, and uh, he just decided to put it to rest, and he's tired, he's uh, he thinks he's managed it enough, he'll still be involved in baseball, he doesn't want to go 
off in the sunset. I'm sure he'll be involved either with the Giants or another team in some capacity. It happens quite often, like Felipe, Felipe Alou was when he, <laughs> you know, uh, was no longer the manager. So uh, yeah, Dusty Baker, yeah, Dusty Baker's back with the team, you know, as a special consultant. Um, so, you know, he'll he'll probably be in some capacity like that, but just away from the day-to-day hardships and stress of managing. As we all know, he's had a couple of heart procedures. He does have his health to consider uh, he's 64 or whatever he is right now. He just had his hip replaced in the off season. So did John Miller, by the way. I didn't know that till last week. Uh, so apparently John Miller and Bochi were texting back and forth on uh, how their each of their rehabs were going. But uh, <laughs> he, uh, he he's uh, yeah, he's he's retiring. And so I think it's probably a best case scenario, to be honest, uh, in terms of how the managerial situation was was handled. And I'm, I'm sure Bochi wasn't explicitly told. I think he's just savvy enough. He just knows, he knows the game. He knows the business. And he's like, look, I'm going to get let go or not offered a contract after this year. Do I really want to manage another year either here or elsewhere? Eh, probably not. I think I've, I've done my fair share. I've been managing here. God knows how long he's a hall of famer. He's got three world championships. So, you know, I think it's just his time to spend time with his, uh, his wife and and his family. So I, I think it was a good move by him. And it does kind of, rest away those questions and you know the Giants also have a little bit of something extra to fight for this year not that it will materialize in a winning season uh but they certainly would like to send Bochi off um not with a sub 500 record that's for sure yeah Buster in that one interview uh I think I retweeted on our uh TorcherCast account he's like yeah Bochi talked to me earlier so Buster knew for like two months he just didn't say anything sure um I don't know if you can hear those pop noises in the background. That's gunfire in the distance. Uh, uh, I oh, nice. Country, so it's okay. Yeah, it's okay. I live in the country. <laughs> yeah, it's just, like, just tar- like, target I'm, practice, yeah. Absolutely. I'm not even flinching, but I didn't know if the mic was picking it up because I have the window open, but all the fans off so you know the people can hear me. But with Bochi, and we'll talk about it more during the season, I think. Uh, we'll just touch on it now because we're, there's Bochi's going to go around. There's going to be um, ceremonies everywhere. You know, you, I liken it to Bobby Cox when he was retiring. It's going to be that kind of a, a year-long send-off. And I, I really appreciate Bochi reading the tea leaves. And knowing I don't want to be a lame duck manager who doesn't know what my contract status is, so I'll just take control and I'll choose, I'll decide my own fate. And it is time. This will be his 25th year managing, and you know he's done more for this Giants organization than any other manager since they moved to San Francisco. Yeah, so, by far. Mm-hmm. You know, for me, it's up to him to decide when he wants to, and he got that opportunity. Uh, you know, it's funny because Smash Mouth has been in the news this past week with their Harper. I know. News. And <laughs> I just funny. want to point out to anybody that is listening how stupid Smash Mouth is. After Bochy announced his retirement, they put out a tweet saying they should fire his ass because they don't need them going into a season with a manager who doesn't care or something to that effect. Oh, so, God, I missed that one. All the love that y'all gave Smash Mouth over the last week, fuck Smash Mouth. <laughs> they are not smart baseball fans. Don't take their opinion on baseball. Please, I beg of you. Uh, Sorry. I know. I, I saw the Harper stuff uh, that they were tweeting out. I did not see that one. That's a pretty damn stupid take. I mean, it is. It's a stupid take. Like, the chi- the, <laughs> the Giants didn't win a World Series until 2010, until this man came along and managed them in the right ways. He's the man who knew to bring Madison Bumgarner in as a relief pitcher against the Phillies. He's the man that had Jeremy Affel continue warming up in the bullpen while the benches were clearing in Philadelphia. And I'm going back to Philadelphia because you don't get the three without the first. Yep. I you totally know, agree with you. He's the guy that saw that Timmy was just firing on all cylinders against Kept the Braves. Kept him in. Gave, yes, and yep. he's like, forget it. Let this guy keep going. You know, if they had gone ten innings, I think he would have sent him back out there. Yeah. So no, you don't. You don't say fire Bruce Bochy. That was the most ridiculous take <laughs> ever. You know, and I, I, I'll be honest. I will not attack Smash Mouth's music. I'm not a musician. I could not have done what they did. But they're idiots when it comes to baseball. <laughs> I love it. All right, so we're going to close up with something that is a little bit of a sensitive topic, and I'm, um, I think both Eric and I are, are going to try to not wade into the tar pits, uh, because, yeah, we just want to report it, um, you know, and I know you guys all know about it, but it is interesting because, boy, I have seen some seriously polar opposite takes in this situation, and um, to be honest, it kind of surprises me some of the 
the disparity in some of the opinions from from Giants fans and other people too, but certainly Giants fans. But as you all probably know and have seen the video uh, a, billion, a million times, Larry Bear was videotaped out at a public park um, in downtown San Francisco. Uh, basically having an argument with his wife, Pam. And, uh, you know, we don't know the entire context of the situation, but all that was videotaped uh, because the guy who had the videotape or the, the cell phone recording had to intervene and help out. But essentially what you see on videotape, and I'm going to try not to mischaracterize anything here, try to be just very objective, is you see Larry Bear uh, lunging and grabbing for a cell phone in which his wife is holding, uh, refusing to give it up, and in the process of trying to wrestle said cell phone out of her hand, uh, she who has an injured foot and was sitting down at the time was basically wrestled kind of out of her chair and fell on the ground. And during this whole time, she's screaming, you know, oh, my God, oh, my God, please help someone, please help or something to that effect. Uh, and then the only other video, because uh, it cuts away after that, is Larry Bear kind of indignantly walking away going, please stop, Pam, please stop, Pam. And then it just kind of walks away uh, and that's all we see uh, pretty much uh, they did release a couple of statements including a joint one saying it was a it was a family it was an argument over a family member which was kind of odd because then there, there was another statement and I don't know if it was after the cell phone video was released or before and they had to clarify but basically yeah Larry kind of cop to yeah I was trying to get my cell phone away from Pam it was dumb it was a mistake I regret it yada 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 and then the joint statement saying everything's fine we're fine there's no problems no <laughs> so and that's been it and so you have one side of the spectrum of people you know saying and I'm I'm not here to judge anyone because here's the thing I I we don't know the entirety of the situation, the entirety of the of the altercation. We don't know the background or the context. We also don't know uh, about why he was grabbing the cell phone and if she was screaming because she really was scared because there's prior domestic violence issues or if she was uh, acting a little bit to try and uh, uh, alleviate the situation by getting public pressure to, for him to stop. I'm not here to judge any of those things, but a lot of people said, hey, anytime you have any kind of physical violence on a woman, I don't care if you're just grabbing a cell phone, you knocked her to the ground, that's horrible, you're, you're an abuser, you're an abuser, you're an abuser, to other people going, dude, he was just trying to get a cell phone and she wouldn't give it up, and he didn't mean to knock her on the ground, God, lay off of him, whatever. I will say this, I'm not going to judge Larry either way, because again, I don't feel that it's fair to do so, especially when we don't know them, we don't know the context, we don't know the background, we don't know any of those things. But I will, the only thing that kind of gets into an opinion, I will say is this. I have never physically wrestled anything away from my wife like that. And so I think that there, there is a line there that he crossed. Um, I'm not saying he's an abuser. I'm just saying I've never done that even in private. And he did that in public. So... I don't know if it was his mistress that was texting him and he was trying to get his phone back or whatever, or his, he thought it was a Bryce Harper calling. I don't know. But <laughs> point being, it was an odd situation. He is now on uh, uh, leave of absence right now, and the Giants board is kind of deciding what to do. So I don't know if you have anything to say about it. Yeah, the Giants released a statement today um, that Larry Bear – is uh, taking a leave from the day-to-day -day operations. He acknowledged his behavior was unacceptable, apologized to the organization, and is committed to taking steps to never happens again. So what this means is basically Zaidi's in charge. Um, but going back to Bear, I, I will agree with you um, that nowhere in my life have I ever wrestled something away from my wife. Um, that's actually what I said to her after we saw the video together. Uh, I, I said, I don't care if it's my cell phone, your cell phone. I don't care what's going on. I just in my life could never imagine doing that. Yeah. Um, but that's me, you know, and that's you. Uh, again, that doesn't paint Larry as an abuser. There's a lot of things we don't know. Uh, as a Giants fan, I just can't wait for the season to start because we have had – it's just been a bad off season between McCovey and McGowan and then uh -huh. you had the Charles Johnson stuff at the beginning of the off season with who he's donating to. And then now with Larry bear, it's one of those things that it's just like the season, the distraction of baseball can't come soon enough. And I do give the giants themselves credit for having him step away and, 
and somebody else take over the day-to-day operations of the team. Yeah. But, you know, I, 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 I can't, I can't judge Larry. I can't judge Pam on this. Um, both sides are coming out. The people who know them saying these are great people and I know them well, you know, and the other people, like you said, who are saying this is abuse and a sign of bigger abuse. But nobody really knows, even with video, you never know the truth. Uh, uh, I just hope that if Major League Baseball is looking into it, you know, let them do their thing. They don't really handle domestic violence issues that well, and we've never really had to talk about them on this show. Yeah. Uh, like, like I said to my wife, I was like, thank goodness we're not a Cubs podcast because we would have had to talk about Addison Russell last oh, year. That's this right. Is not yeah. an, this is not an easy subject, especially for us two, you know, white guys in the 40s, you know, I'm almost 40, uh, that, you know, it's tough for us to have a take. I, I reached out to some women that I know and nobody got back to me in time for recording today to see what their takes on the situation were because we're just not qualified to uh, really form strong opinions on it that would be worth anything. Yeah, I, t- I totally agree. I just feel like I'm, I'm not qualified to do it. Um... Yeah, and you know everyone calling for Bear's head, he needs to resign immediately. I don't necessarily agree with that because again, how are you judging the guy on everything? And if your if your benchmark is is just one little three second clip of him wrestling a cell phone away, okay, that's your opinion. That's fine. I'm not saying they're wrong because maybe there is a history that we're not aware of where he is like that. I don't know, but it's also different than you know uh, some of those videotapes of football players you know, beating the crap out of their wife in the elevator, you know, um, that, it, there is there is a gray area here. Um, again, it's not something I've ever done. It's not something I condone. It's not something that I, I like because it could suggest something that has happened in the past. But uh, I've lost my temper before. And even though I haven't wrestled something away from my wife, I've thrown things across the room. I've punched a wall and I've yelled, right? So yes, to, absolutely. To, to someone who maybe had seen a videotape of me doing any of those things would say the same thing. Like, you can't have, look at how enraged he became. He can't control his emotions. He's dangerous. He can't hold that position anymore, right? I mean, so, and and it could be a sign of domestic abuse or or past abuse or whatever, even though it's not, but I can understand someone's take who is sensitive to that. So again, I, I don't know what happened. I don't have an opinion. I, I don't know if Bear should be in that position anymore or not. I'm not qualified to make that judgment. But I will, I will say that it, it, it just, it's something he shouldn't certainly should not have done in a public place. That's that's for damn sure. No matter what. <laughs> Yeah, it's just it's unfortunate all around. Yeah, it's unfortunate all around uh, for Pam, for Larry, for the Giants organization, for you know anybody who it dredges up anything for. And it just sucks that the Giants have this other stuff going on around them. Yeah. It'd be nice to just focus on baseball. And, and, and so I was going to say, you know, moving away from that because we're kind of wrapping up with this horrible news we have to talk about. But to look forward to the baseball season every year, I, I go and I've started. I've been doing this since 2013. The Giants will send you 10 pocket schedules, so you can have a giant schedule with you at all times if you nice. want to. And living in Georgia, you know, yeah, I can open my app and stuff like that. But sometimes it's nice to just have the schedule sitting on your desk or in your car. And you're like, oh, what time's the game today? And you look down and I don't know, being older, you know, there's a bit <laughs> of nostalgia to it. So, you know, if you want to, you can go to Giants.com, SFGiants.com. And under schedule, there's a, a tab where you can order up to 10 pocket schedules to have them sent to you. And which is one of those things that I thought of. I want to pass along to other fans that I do it every year and – you know, I always end up with a bunch that I don't fold up, but what do I care? You know, it's my keepsake. What if this is the year that they win the title? This can go in the scrapbook, you know? So <laughs> I figured I'd, I'd share I'd share that with other Giants fans, you know, and give us something else to, to look forward to here as we're wrapping up and actual baseball. And they usually, they come pretty quick. I will have them before the season starts, I guarantee it. Oh, that's plus, fantastic. That's pretty cool. I didn't even know they did that. It's yeah, great. plus it's nice to get... It's, it literally just comes in an envelope from the Giants. So you get the whole Giants return address thing in the corner with, like, the park and 24 at Willie Mays Drive. Yeah. So, you know, it's kind of neat to get mail from the Giants. It, it's I've gotten a few things by now, and I'll, I'll never tire of seeing that Giants logo in the corner when I open my mailbox. I love it. All right. Well, um, gosh, that's, that's pretty cool. i got to do that right away. 
Uh, well, that's going to do it for episode 158. We're always trying to get under an hour, guys, but you know what? Eric and I haven't talked in a while, and we just like talking. What do you do? I, I, I think jokes. we got close this time. <laughs> We're closer, still a little over, but that's okay. Um, but you can follow us collectively at TortureCast or individually at ChadK21 for myself or at Two Out Hits for Eric. That's with the number two. Like us on Facebook. We do have a new Instagram account. Uh, we're not extremely active on it yet, but if you have Instagram, go ahead and give us a like and uh, we'll start you know, doing stuff there. Uh, as we thaw out of the winter here, we will certainly become much more active. In fact, if you check the social media accounts today, you'll see Willie Mays as the main number for how many days we have left until opening day. So that's right. It puts us at March 28th when the Giants open up the 2019 season in San Diego. Uh, I'm going to be traveling for the better part of the two weeks prior to that. Some really exciting stuff we'll talk about um, because, you know, weather may preclude some diving. But if it works out, some pretty cool stuff I'm going to be doing with the BBC and Woods Hole. Uh, but it looks like we're going to try and squeeze in a season preview uh, podcast on, I believe, March uh, 29th or so. Uh, 28th or 29th. Um, I guess it would have to be 29th, Friday, because <laughs> I get back late on that Thursday. Um, oh, no, the season starts um, on the 20th. No, I meant no. the 22nd. Yeah, we were talking, yeah. I was going to say the week before. 21st, 22nd. yeah, 21st or the 22nd. That would be it. That's right, after I get back from, from Baston. I'm going to be out in Baston in Rhode Island. Pack my car in the driveway. Oh, that was horrible. Um, <laughs> Pack your car in the yard. How about them apples? So uh, <laughs> Gotta see that'll do it girl. for episode 158. You have anything to to pimp, Eric? Uh, no, I'm sure I I have a, a thank you letter to Bochi that I've been um, penning, and I'm sure I'll put it up before the season starts. But other than that, you know, if the whim strikes me, I'll put something up. If not, you know, who knows. Life's a lot busier this day. I'm a woodworker now, so yes, know, life's yes. busier. Wood, wood whisperer. I've seen some of his projects. <laughs> he's he's getting pretty handy with the wood there and the saws and all the other woodworking implements. But yeah, one thing I think we'll send out. Uh, we traditionally for our season preview, we always kind of predict the Giants' record. Uh, and lately, it's been going south. But it's always fun to get your predictions. So I remember in years past, we've had crazy predictions of 110 wins uh, winning the World Series to 60 wins. Yeah, yeah that, that was pretty insane. So uh, we'll send out uh, some social media bits about that. Maybe either have a form or just you kind of respond to us. And we'll, and we'll collect a couple dozen of these and see kind of where the, uh, the pulse of our listeners are in terms of their optimism or pessimism for this season. Uh, but that'll do it for us episode 158 we'll see you in a couple weeks for episode 159 until then a boom a big thank you to everybody for listening to the torture cast the podcast by and for fans of the San Francisco Giants follow us on Twitter at TortureCast. you can also like us on Facebook or check out our blog at TortureCast.com I also want to say thank you to Ashcon and Bailey for letting us use their song Feeling Like a Giant for our intro for Ben Lee and Chad King my name is Willie Dills and We'll see you next time.